So thank you so much for having me today. And it's a pleasure to return to Hemp Build 2022 and to continue the discussion in project management. So without further ado, let's get going. So Hempstone is myself and Tom Ross Masler. We make a great team. We both are high performance builders with very different backgrounds. Tom comes from a conventional commercial and construction and residential background development experience uh, connected to state and federal, federal energy efficiency programs, whereas I've been heavily steeped in natural building and DIY all the way up to large scale construction at the residential scale, explicitly using materials that are abundant, renewable um, and local. And so together we have made Hempstone. Uh, we've been in business since 2018 and our business model has been very flexible, adapting to a nascent industry. And so over the course of the next hour, you'll see a, a portfolio of our work, which spans three of the four different installation methods. And we pride ourselves on being at the forefront of what the industry has to offer in the United States and supporting and championing that so that we can bring a, the diversity of hempcrete to the United States. So we started um, like most people do with a cast in place installation. This is from 2020 and we partnered very closely with the construction company that designed and built it. And the owner of the construction company was actually the client. And so we had a very close relationship. This project allowed us to have a very tight knit team. It was almost like a hive mind mentality. And the result of that was a very affordable project that um, was able to transition the construction company into adopting hempcrete as a natural building material. We went from that to uh, different installation methods. We cast away the cast in place methodology, so to speak, pretty quickly and started helping designers and architects to work with other materials specifically or other installation methods as specifically spray and block and so this series of two buildings was the first to integrate a block and a spray method in the same structure it was done on the structure on the right but not on the left this is that picture in actuality that square structure with a spray application and that is a 12 inch wall uh, all sprayed. Our largest project to date is a 6,000 square foot residential project on the coast of Cape Cod and utilized a European spray machine that was brought specifically for this project. So we have a couple different examples of spray apply to, to work from as we continue our discussion. This project utilized a veritable army of uh, trades personnel and building professionals to manifest this project, as you can see here. And so we've had the luxury of working at both a very small scale where it's the hive mind to a large team of professionals that have to navigate and coordinate their various uh, uh, focuses and specializations. So today what we're talking about is project management. I mentioned that I did that. I talked about project management last year at the same event. When, and that is still available to you through this website, the USHBA um, website through a replay. And I watched it again last night just to see how to, how to sort of frame this discussion. And I would encourage you, uh, if you are interested in understanding project management, how to do that with a project that goes beyond the hive mind. If you're working with a team of builders, then the principles that I share in that project uh, management 
presentation are foundational for you to understand. And I'll give you a, a brief outline of what I discuss because it is the foundation for what we're gonna talk about today. So I titled it Project Management Steps. It could have been subtitled Challenges and Opportunities. So in any project, especially a project where uh, we are including a new material or a new material to most of the individuals you, that are in, involved in manifesting the project, there is um, some real foundational work that has to happen. And so we start with the, the fundamentals. We're managing those expectations. It's a rare situation where as a subcontractor, one says, I'm involved at, from the design phase all the way till we get to the punch list right before I hand the keys to the client. However, a hempcrete subcontractor, particularly a hempcrete subcontractor who is um, either managing or installing the finishes for their hempcrete is involved optimally from the earliest design all the way to that punch list and the handing of the keys. And that's not, that's not traditional for a subcontractor. So this foundational framework that I'm trying to lay out for you is important because as a, as a hempcrete professional, you're involved from start to finish. So we start with the fundamentals and in project management, the fundamental is managing expectations. Your job first and foremost is to communicate what to expect, to plan that build and then to execute that plan so that it is successful and streamlined. The opportunity that comes with hempcrete, especially as a hempcrete installer, is that you uh, are teaching your team, whether that's one person, the owner who also happens to be the general contractor who is planning to do their design, all the way to a veritable army of individuals and specialists, whether that's structural engineers, architectural designers, interior designers, landscape architects, your MEP trades, that's mechanical, electrical, plumbing, your framing subcontractors, your roofing subcontractors, the list does go on and on. Your job as a hempcrete project manager is to ensure that those trade partners understand any breaks con from conventional construction. And with hempcrete, there's quite a number. So your job is to convene and communicate to all of your stakeholders uh, so that everyone is aware of, this, of what to expect and to get very clear project criteria so that you are make, able to, as a professional hempcrete project manager, suggest the best installation method. So clear project criteria include how long the build is supposed to take or any uh, restrictions on when that finish date needs to be. In particular, um, a value to know when you're doing any wet apply installation with hempcrete is, are there any constraints to its final date of move in ready? There's also cost implications, quality uh, implications, and of course, the most important, the client's driving values. When you're talking about a product like hempcrete, uh, it is typically a client-led initiative, and they are coming to your uh, coming to this material because it is safe, natural, environmentally friendly, and durable. And so those become project values and criteria that you utilize throughout the build. So then you take all that information with all of the stakeholders uh, so that everyone's on the same page, and then you determine what is the best hempcrete insulation method. In this first hour, that um, you have access to through a replay. I talk about communicating logistics to the design build team, including your general contractors, your MEPs, your framers, engineers. And then I detail the logistics uh, challenges and opportunities of materials, equipment, dry time, install, prep, schedule, finishes, and repairs. So I'm gonna touch on a, two specific points for the rest of this hour. 
We're going to talk about the methods of installation. And then we're going to talk about uh, and we're going to detail that. And then we're going to talk about finishes. If we have time, we're going to end with an update on uh, costs as we see them at this point. So a quick review, hempcrete is simply three materials, lime, hemp, and water. It is utilized in four different installation methods. Two of them are wet apply, two of them are dry apply. So the two top, uh, the top left is cast in place, the top right is spray apply, bottom left is panel, that is a dry, you, comes to site dry and ready to install, and the bottom right is a block system which also comes dry, cured, ready to install. So here's the bread and butter of what we're talking about today. There's four different installation methods and there's four fundamental criteria that you need to be paying attention to. And they, depending on your site conditions and your project criteria, you will, as the project manager, without disclosing all of the options available to your, to your uh, project team, because that can be overwhelming, navigate those project criteria and those site conditions and the design specifics to help determine which of these four installations or the combination of these four installations are the right um, installations for this project or for your build. So let's start at the very left. So for time, cast in place takes the most time. Matt Marino was speaking right before me and he mentioned this too. He's gone from cast in place straight to panel. And you can see, at least on site, the amount of time needed to install a cast in place is significantly larger than a panel. A panel system, depending on the scale of your project, the size of your panels could be a one, two, three, four day install, whereas a cast in place is multiple weeks. Um, spray apply is a little bit faster. Block is faster yet depending on the, um, the masons that are working with you, but we'll get to that in a little bit. We'll talk about that more in just a second. So as we move over to money, we see that a cast in place is relatively cost effective. The spray apply is a little bit cheaper. We actually have some numbers for you that I'll share in just a second. Um, block at this point, simply because of manufacturing, sourcing is the most expensive option. Panel is a little bit of a shot in the dark, except that the, I, the notion of panelization is that it needs to be at, as a cost of effective as possible. And so you're translating um, the, the cost that it, would, that it would take to build a project on site. You're putting that in a manufacturing warehouse or a facility and you're streamlining those costs. So it should be cheaper. We don't have an exact number. Hempstone is starting to develop panels. Matt Marino's developing panels. Those costs are still in development. It's obviously very expensive to build the first one, but then if you take that same technology and you expand it out, it becomes cost effective as you build more panels and more projects. So that number's a little bit up in the air, but it we got a good front foundation. So for labor and skill required, we're talking about the people that come to do the actual hempcrete installation. And so let's talk about that. Um, going down each category. So for a cast in place um, installation, you need to have someone who understands how to mix hempcrete. So you need a mixer and you need to have carpenters that can handle plumb and level. And then you have enough people that can provide the labor to fill out the installation. So in terms of conventional construction, uh, it is somewhat comparable to someone mixing a batch of concrete and putting and framing a wall. So yes, there are skills, but there's skills that most construction um, op construction workers have at least some relationship with based on other more conventional processes. The equipment is also relatively simple. You have a simple mixer. Uh, and then a way to move that material into the 
wall or roof or floor assembly. So not very much equipment, obviously need some power, you need some water, but pretty basic. As we move down to spray apply, you need all those skills. You need someone who can mix, you need someone, you need carpenters that can do um, manage plumbing level. You need laborers to fill it out, but you also need two more particular skill sets. You need someone who can um, install the hempcrete using the machine at their disposal in smartly enough that you're not having failures as the, as the wall is built up. And so there is, if you ever heard Cameron McIntosh speak, he often says this is a user heavy tool, his nozzle, because you have to get a feel for it. You have to develop a relationship to how you're putting the material in. Uh, so it's a very specialized skill. The other specialized skill is we are now getting into equipment that has high PSI. It's often a pneumatic equipment. It's, it's you're using air compressors, you're using generators, you're using mixing, um, mixing machines that are often diesel engines. And so having a equipment specialist on hand is a valuable and important skill. Somebody has to be able to fix the equipment if it goes down and problems shoot that. Also with a spray apply, um, it is more efficient to utilize uh, crane style equipment or hoist style equipment to do the installation than it can be to do scaffolding depending on the installation or, or the, um, the, the building um, massing. So that would be a separate skill. You need to have a crane operator, someone who can utilize the crane. That could be the person who's also running the gun, depending on the job, but it's not always feasible. So that's three specialized skills. That's why it gets a number of four hammers. Block, it's not that it's super easy specifically, it's that we have a skilled masonry industry, people that are professionals in their trade, and you can take a hempcrete block and substitute it for a standard ICU block, and there's no difference except for the weight of the block itself. So it's a, it's a, st it's a standardized skill. Not everyone knows how to install masonry. It is a proper skill but you, that is one of the, of the four different installation methods. This is the one that you can hand off to a trades person and have them go running with it with very little training or explanation of what the difference is. They'll just take it and go. Panelized, you're talking, depending on the size of the panel itself, you're talking about plumb and level, but you also have a crane operator. Um, Matt Marino was just before us. He was saying that his panels are the size that he requires a skid operator, skid steer, and he's trying to stay away from a crane. But as you go larger in your panels, you'll need some sort of crane equipment in order to maneuver the panels on the site. So that's an operator as well. And you have to have a team of people that can really uh, use, utilize plumb and level and support a, it's just like a framing of a wall, except for it's now heavy. It's a complete wall system. So that's something to be taken into account. Last section is equipment. We mentioned uh, cast in place is, uh, a, a, can be as a very simple mixing station. Spray applied, we're taking more equipment. We are running it uh, hempcrete through a hose. We are utilizing generators and compressors in addition to our mixing equipment. So, and those are specialized to the spray equipment that you're using. So different mixing systems, different compressors, different generators, depending on what kind of spray machine you have. Block again, we're really just talking about a trowel uh, and a, a mixing pan for mortar and you're good to go. So this again, it's not that it's no skill, it's that this is a trade that is very well established. And so hiring a mason is a fine way as a installer or as a GC to move forward with hempcrete. And then equipment for panels is not only the equipment required on site, for example, a crane, but also the equipment that is required in the manufacturing process to bring it to site. So you're talking about large scale mixers, 
uh, equipment that's large enough in a manufacturing facility to move panels of whatever size you're building. So I promise to talk numbers. These numbers are based on aggregate data from Hempstone based on our actual installation times and the materials costs as of spring 2022. So cast by hand is slightly more expensive than spray applied. You'll notice the difference between materials on the left and labor on the right. So cast by hand is $14 in materials per cubic foot compared to $22 in labor per cubic foot. Spray apply, it's a little bit um, less labor intensive, uh, but the additional equipment costs that you have to have to utilize the spray equipment does mean that your materials costs, materials and equipment cost is higher. For block, we've got a lot of different variability. We actually paid closer to the $26 as a cubic foot for our blocks. We've heard that, or we've um, heard that there are other options, but didn't have access to them. We've also explored what it would cost if we started building at scale. That's how we got closer to the $12 a square foot. That is not, and at least in my awareness, that is not currently available in market. So if you're looking at block right now and you don't have the ability to make your own, it's definitely more expensive. And then panelized is again, a little bit of a shooting a dart, but that's the sort of price range that we're imagining we could get to with, within a relatively short order, but we don't have any, any knowledge, at least on site, of what that's gonna cost. So it's a little bit of a question mark, but that gives you a sense of what we're, what we're looking at. We have done a block project. We were not, we're not masons. We learned masonry as we went. Um, so we don't have a solid dollar per cubic foot figure. However, if you're interested in talking to um, or considering block, it's relatively simple to communicate with a mason and ask what their dollar per cubic foot of install for an ICU is and you can get a, a general basis of comparison. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the labor skills that are required in a hempcrete build. So we require a veritable team of people, like we mentioned, we're gonna have laborers, we're gonna have mix masters, we're gonna have people that understand equipment. We need to have people that can run the overall numbers and manage the process. There needs to be a site supervisor that communicates with the general contractor and the other subs to streamline the wall assemblies that include hempcrete. And then there's specialized labor in terms of spray installers and building performance specialists. So this is especially tricky as we start to integrate hempcrete in high performance assemblies where hempcrete itself is not airtight. So the finishes that we use need to be. So from our left, we have Naveed, he's our mix master. Uh, Fred in the right is a building performance specialist and focuses has focused on high performance building design. He also happens to speak be fluent in French, which was handy for a job that we did with Lauren Goudet. And then the gentleman on the right is Cameron McIntosh spraying using the Valkyrie system, which is from France. Uh, Angela and Graham are on the left. It's always important to have some really good laborers that can just do what we would call grunt work with a good attitude in messy, hot conditions. It sounds easy, but it can be a hempcrete work environment can be taxing um, and long because typically you're working, you're not working very close to home, you're working within a condensed time schedule. Um, and so we have real conditions that are um, taxing. So a good attitude and a capacity to manage the expectations of laborers, you're gonna be shoveling hempcrete off the floor and taking it back to a machine all day kind of attitude it, or energy awareness and ability to handle those kind of work environments is essential. And, and laborers are an essential part of what makes hempcrete viable. It is very expensive to install hempcrete compared to cellulose insulation for as a contrast. And we rely on 
a broad skill set that includes some simple labors in order to achieve our our installation as cost effectively as possible. We rely on the laborers. Um, and uh, it's also very important to have someone in the crew that can handle equipment. It's great when everything's going well and we're moving and we're getting stuff in the wall. And when there's a breakdown on the hoist or in the mixer or in the gun or in um, the delivery device, whatever that is, it breaks down the whole crew. So you have to have someone on your crew that can immediately fix things. And we're in this situation as hempcrete installers that we are often engaging a crew for a short stint of time for an inst for a hempcrete spray installation. We're typically between five and 10 days for a cast in place. We're between two and four weeks. And for each coat of plaster, we're usually about four to five days. So we have to gear up a team of people that can work in short spurts per, sporadically through the year uh, without having a consistent um, job to go to week after week after week. I wish we could say we have jobs lined up for the entire 12 months and that we could, we could support uh, keeping an entire crew of six to seven people on staff year round, but we just don't have that capacity yet. Hempcrete does not have that capacity yet. We at Hempstone serve all of New England. So we're serving seven states and we're able to keep busy for stretches of weeks and months at a time, but not year round. So something to keep in mind is that as you are managing your hempcrete installations, you're also managing a team of professionals with a variety of skill sets that need to be able to be flexible enough to come and go from your crew. So let's dive into equipment for a second, shall we? So a hempcrete cast in place is the simplest way to install hempcrete. It could be as simple as a mortar trough and a bucket. For the Goshen installation, it was a GCB, JCB skid steer with a concrete mixer attached to it, some scaffolding, and some gorilla tubs. And that was the equipment used. It was a very quiet, serene installation. It took four people four and a half weeks to do this install. In contrast, we have a spray installation. This is on uh, for square at Wally Farms. You can see it's actually taller than it is wide. Uh, and the, so in this particular installation, we really miss, needed to have a hoist that could get up and maneuver around the building as smoothly as possible. So you'll see on the right of the image, there is the mixing station where two people are um, doing their tasks. One is mixing, one is raking into the Arezi machine. Cameron's up spraying and you don't see it now, but there's always a fourth person that's picking up rebound, putting it in those buckets and bringing it back to the mixer. This is another shot of the spray machine. This is over blocks. Uh, and as the machine is moving back and forth, Cameron has gotten very good at both maneuvering the, the hoist and shooting the gun. There's still people on the ground that have to maneuver the hoses and keep things moving and streamlined. So this is the Cape Cod installation. And in this particular job, we utilize the Valkyrie on the right. It is a all-in-one machine. It has its mixer and its um, compressor to push the, the material wherever on the site that it needs to go. It does not get moved, it is stationary, um, and the hoses are long enough that you can get to anywhere, including the roof. So this building was hempcreted for the roof, the walls, and even the basement walls. So for this installation, we obviously needed to get up and around, so we were going to be using a hoist and this large Valkyrie system. 
Oh, sorry about that, everyone. Um, what you don't see is a separate large compressor that was also running or a generator that was running the entire time that had to also be stored and stabilized. So when mm, there is a picture of, oh, I'll show you later. There's a So for this part of the installation, we still just use the hoist. Things changed when we started doing line plaster. If you're doing, uh, in this case, we did a basement installation of a, using a spray machine that delivers mostly dry material to the nozzle or dry material to the nozzle and then gets sprayed wet. So there were instances where the air quality of the sprayer uh, were not sufficient and we needed to provide ventilation uh, fresh air intake and exhaust outtake for this. So that is another piece of equipment that does need to be considered depending on your installation. For hempcrete masonry, we simply had to use the fundamental carpentry skills of plumb and level to build up the walls. There are specific skills that masons have that carpenters don't have that we did our best to learn for this in particular project. The gentleman on the far right uh, is Fred and he came from a concrete background specifically in France. And so he was able to utilize these hempcrete blocks with no problem compared to an ICF block. And he had the fortunate or perhaps unfortunate job of trying to teach us carpenters and natural builders how to build with with um, masonry blocks. He did a pretty good job, I think. So those are the basic installation methods, the labor that is required and the equipment that is needed in order to make them function well. Now let's get into some of what I've been thinking about a lot for the last year since the last time we talked as project managers. A year ago, I was thinking really mostly about hempcrete, the finer details of hempcrete. But in the last year, I've really been thinking about finishes. I've come to this product or material as a natural builder that specifically loves lime plaster. So to me, hempcrete is the perfect substrate for my lime plaster. Not all lime plasters are the same and not all lime plaster details are the same as we've come to learn. And so I wanna share some of our successes and challenges with you. So this is the interior plaster of the Goshen house. It is broken every 12 feet by vertical timber frames and um, posts. And it had, there's a beam at about every seven and a half feet. There's knee braces in the corners. And though this can seem a little complicated because you have all these different sections, what that means is that when you, once you learn the basic skills of plaster, you have very small areas that need to be plastered. It means that a very small team of plasterers could work uh, at, their, at any pace to get this project built. It also means that uh, though you have some detail, once you work around those details, it's a pretty simple installation, such that we had a construction crew that had never touched um, any sort of lime plaster, and they were able to get this build installed to their client specification without any problem. It did help that the um, client was also one of the installers, as you can see here in the middle on the left. Um, and this is a good example of a finish. So this is a lime plaster with a painted um, lime-based finish. And you can achieve that pretty simply. When we are talking to clients, we now utilize resources such as this picture to give an, an understanding of the different kinds of finishes and the potential cost implications thereof. In contrast, one can have a very streamlined, um, simple looking plaster that rounds the edges into the window reveal and makes really nice, clean lines where you have a very simple trim board and maybe no, no um, broken visuals in the plaster. This can translate 
to an expensive plaster installation. And the reason for that is that every facade or face of your plaster has to be done in one go. So if you have a large face, whether any face of a, bit of a wall, you have to have enough plasters, at least for the finish coat especially, that can go in one go. In addition, as you round these bends and make this tie to your trim very neatly and make this consistent, these sorts of details can add considerable expense. So there's definitely, what we've learned at Hempstone is that details make all the difference in terms of the cost and the practicality of using lime plaster as an interior. And part of this is hindered by the fact that we don't have a robust lime plaster trades um, in this country. And so there are some places, the Southwest, for example, some places in more urban New England, there are professional lime plasters. But outside of those limited areas, if you want to have a lime plaster finish, which is what is often touted as a natural companion to hempcrete, you have to usually, you either have to accept that there is a limited type of finish or you have to pull into your repertoire professional natural builders that might not be local to you. For example, we, in order to get a finish that is comparable to this for the Wally Farms job, we had to hire the best plasters in New England. And, uh, and that comes at a cost. They don't necessarily live local to where the job is. Their rates are higher because they're the best in the business. Uh, and the work that you're expecting of them is takes longer. So it has a threefold, can have a threefold effect. So we've started thinking about what are some alternatives to plaster on the inside uh, in conjunction with what are some plaster details that we can um, suggest to the clients to keep that plaster cost as low as possible while um, retaining the look and the feel of lime plaster. And again, this is, I'm not necessarily talking to the DIYer, I'm talking to the, the builder who is looking to replicate a hempcrete build uh, and integrate that into their, into their company. And so we have started to explore interior walls that have wood and perhaps some sort of small smart membrane behind that wood as an interior air barrier, as well as utilizing simpler details of having picture rails and um, very streamlined trim around wood so that there's no plaster reveals. If you have wood inside all of your windows then you don't have to worry about plaster reveals. You can detail your trim work around your windows such that the plaster is as simple and streamlined and easy to install as possible. So now we've talked about interior plaster. Let's for a second talk about exterior plaster. Now, interior plaster is very typical with hempcrete. Exterior plaster, especially where I live in New England, can be problematic because we have a short window that uh, is within the uh, per correct climate or temperature for lime plaster to be installed. We also have a very harsh conditions and a building vernacular that doesn't give a lot of support. What I mean by that, look here where there's a two and a half story building and I have probably eight or 10 inch overhangs. Now compare that to a typical natural building where you've got perhaps a one or one and a half story building with two or three foot overhangs. We just don't give a lot of protection in New England based on how we build our buildings and how they look to offer these large facades of plaster um, the protection that they need against driven rain and snow um, and other harsh conditions. So 
An exterior line plaster requires scaffolding to get all the way around. You can't use a hoist. You have to you, you have to be able to maneuver and get your hand on every inch of that wall. And lime plaster by its nature, and let, depending on the aggregate, uh, is typically very heavy. So a lime plaster is three, typically three parts aggregate to one part lime. The aggregate is typically found within 10 or 15 miles. It's a sand. You're mixing those together, adding water and putting it on a wall by hand. You can uh, use mortar sprayer or mortar gun and put it up that way and then just come back with a trowel and smooth it off. So two different ways to do it. Um, both are labor intensive. One sort of in the same vernacular as we talked about for the hempcrete. One requires to have an equipment operator that can handle um, pumping issues or when the thing gets stuck or uh, when it gets clogged. There, there's some certainly some dynamics to think about. Either way, you've got a product that is on your wall exposed to climatic conditions that needs to be managed for moisture for a certain amount of time um, after it's put on the wall. So you can see here I have burlap uh, protecting the lime plaster after installation. And what we do is we wet the burlap to make sure that there's enough moisture to allow the lime plaster to cure slowly rather than cure and um, deabsorb its water quickly because there's potential for cracking and or there's not enough curing time for the plaster if it's dried too quickly. So there's a couple different nuances about exterior plaster. In this situation, we uh, had a lot of height and a large amount of plaster to install. The lime plaster was not the finish. This was simply the air barrier for um, this build, for this hempcrete installation. And then we installed um, some battens or some battens were installed outboard of that to uh, apply a standard vernacular cedar shake siding. So let's go back for just a second. So here again, we're not using the hoist. We have to get our hands on every single square inch, even though this was um, pumped. This was a pumped mortar uh, exterior installation. So we pumped it onto the wall and then we smoothed it with a hand trowel afterwards. Uh, and so you have to get around all the, so you have to be able to get to all your sides and we used pump jacks in that situation to maneuver us around the wall. Now, uh, I wanna briefly say that an air tightness barrier of lime plaster has its challenges. It looks really good in a drawing, it works perfectly, nothing could go wrong, but then sometimes uh, if you look closely on uh, where the battens have little spacers, those spacers can actually damage or puncture into the plaster itself. I thought I had a close up for you, but I don't, I'm sorry. So it's something to think about in reality. So building performance. We are high performance natural builders. We're focused on providing an energy efficient uh, net carbon beneficial building. So we're looking at both uh, materials and operations. Uh, and that's the beauty of utilizing natural building, building materials and building science together. So building performance. And the way we get there, uh, we, we utilize tests such as a blower door test to evaluate how much air infiltration we have. I mentioned earlier that hempcrete is not airtight uh, we did a blower door test of the Goshen house without any plaster on it, and it was reading at 23.8 air changes per hour at 50 Pascal. Once we put an exterior lime plaster on the interior ex uh, facade, then we went down to 3.02 air changes per hour. Um, there was continued to be work done by the general contractors. Eventually, this building came in at uh, 2.0 air changes per hour. But because we were the line, we were the hempcrete installers and we were consulting on line plaster uh, for, the, for the crew to do the installation, we 
not necessarily owned, but we supported the uh, manifestation of a good air tightness barrier for this installation. And it's something that hempcrete installers should think about because you do have a very sort of not spongy, but um, airy product. And so air tightness is a key critical piece. How are you going to make that building airtight? And for air tightness, all the details are in the tiny little, uh, it's all about the details. So every penetration, whether that's a window or a door, or that is a cable, going through you at the last minute, you have a cable person or your HVAC folks, anyone who's penetrating your wall assembly and therefore your air barrier needs to be in good communication about how to resolve that, um, that penetration. So with lime plaster, it is an air barrier. The challenge for any kind of plaster is that it doesn't like disparate materials. It, if you plaster up to a wood, you will notice that there is a, as it dries, it will pull itself away from the wood. And it's very hard to, to not have it do that. You can even go back with lime plaster and it will still pull away. So it does not connect to wood. So what you need, so that is a, an area where a, uh, there will be air infiltration. And you might not think it's that big of a deal, but those little slivers uh, around every penetration really do add up to very big hole equivalents in your wall. Some as much as it's like having a big open window, two by two window. And so we deal with that by making sure that we have good air tightness strategies. So the one the this air tightness strategy that we prefer at this time is the Contiga tape by uh, Proclima. It attaches to the wood. It spans over that division between the wood and the plaster with a air tightness felt. And then the blue mesh actually gets embedded in the plaster and is locked in the plaster. It provides a solid air tightness seal at every penetration. There it is, there's that picture I was telling you about. So remember I was saying that you can have a lime plaster and then that's great, but then if this is your air barrier and all of a sudden you're having to chip away at it to get in some battens and or some spacers, then you can effectively damage your air barrier. So it's, there's a difference between what a good construction drawing looks like and what a good insight installation detail is like. And your job as a project manager is to shepherd that process and help everyone feel successful at doing their job. And so sometimes that means talking to the designer pretty early on to say that's a really nice drawing, but in the field, it's not going to work. And sometimes it's being on site and talking to the next person that's engaging on your wall assembly and saying, here's how to work with our material so that you're not undermining our process and um, uh, undermining your own. So Henry, I wanna check in with you because we have a few minutes left. And if there's any questions, I want to give time for that. And if there's not any questions, I thought I would share some um, hempcrete by the numbers that Tom came up this this spring. Oh, fantastic. Can you hear me okay? I just switched back on. Uh, so let's take a, can you hear me okay? Just checking. I can, yes. Okay, perfect. I'll turn the camera on also. Again, thanks for a, a fantastic presentation. Uh, just looking through some of the comments, uh, folks are commenting on the uh, the value that you, you've offered to listeners today um so sweet. See. thanks y'all yeah really nice comments here let me just read a, a, a couple of these um jennifer creates a work environment that emphasizes safety first and foremost really important around caustic lime and other crews on site so yay to you because <laughs> i understand that it, it's, i guess it's part of a challenge with building depending on who's on your site um, what are some of the challenges you face with, with trying to keep things safe? Oh, um, well, I would say that educating 
newcomers to what Lyme is, is helpful. I can also, so I'm a safety person. I have been using Lyme since 2005 and I don't have any scars on my arms to prove it. Thank God. <laughs> um, <laughs> now Lyme is caustic and it can yes. cause scars. So I, you know, I do the whole from top down um, safety talk. And I think some people could roll their eyes and then they get hot or they think, uh, or they hear conflicting advice. Some people say, definitely as a line plaster, don't wear gloves because you got to feel the wall. Um, and then people get line burns. So Yes. I, I do what I do. I talk about the safety and then I invite people to experience for themselves. Um, and some people get burned and some people don't. It really depends on how sensitive their skin is. Okay. There's a question I think was answered in the, the, the chat by Tom, but it might be worth adding uh, additional comments. Um, what is the mortar made from? If you want to expand that just a bit, I can also read through Tom's response. No Portland cement. Yeah. Hempstone has used natural hydraulic cement from France in full or in part with cheaper hydraulic lime. Also have used NHL 3.5 equivalent from both Europe and the U.S. Have also used uh, medicaline clay with hydraulic lime. Mm -hmm. And like or a hydrated lime, typically. So um, lime is quite versatile. And if for anyone getting into lime or into hempcrete as a builder, then you sort of just want to start with the basics. Use a moderately hydraulic lime that is either uh, imported or is made in the United States or Canada and mixed with a pozzolan. There are a couple different options here in the United States that you can choose from. Uh, and then and then just keep it real simple. Lime plaster, on the other hand, can get more confusing because think of it like it, it's a spectrum from high purity lime all the way to high impurity lime. And all I mean by mm -hmm. that is that there's other materials like clays and and other minerals that dilute the lime and give it unique characteristics, including um, its capacity to set harder and set faster and be more weather resistant. Okay, thank you. So we've got just a few more minutes. So would you like to share a few uh, thoughts or comments on your team and uh, what you're looking forward to as you continue in this year and how people who are listening can engage with some of your services and offerings? Yeah, so I'm super excited to take the best of what I had from my past, which is alternative culture, a very collaborative uh, spirit, and be able to use utilize that in our industry. We are a very, very small niche within a niche. So we're high performance natural builders specifically using hempcrete. There are dozens of us, <laughs> you know? So um, what that means is that we are not in competition. All of the hempcrete sure. players in this country and beyond are our comrades, are our mentors. Uh, and if, if we can, if, to the extent that we can develop our own knowledge and expertise and be able to share that with others, we are thrilled. And so what that means on the job site, and this plays a little bit into the presentation from last year is, we are very collaborative and mm. we're bringing in, we, we've, we've always been encouraging of new different ways to install, new different, new partners to work with that bring their skill sets and having to come with a student or learning mentality because we're new. We're all still so new at this and, and we're learning from others and we're adapting to what we're experiencing and we're we're exploring and learning as we go as well. Yeah, so I think we're just about out of time. There's some interesting comments here. So I think we're gonna need to figure out how to do a follow-up and talk about some of the ideas around uh, liquid uh, or applied uh, liquid air membranes, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe one fun fact as we prepare to, to finish, I understand you have experience with earth ships. 
Yeah. So I started my my natural building journey with the three book compendium by Michael Reynolds, who's the architect behind the Earthships. And he opened my world to this idea that you could make your own doors and windows and bathtubs and toilets. And it just rocked my world. And mm. it started me on a natural building journey. And if not for Earthships, I would not be here today. Awesome, because I know there, there are people all over the world that are watching some of the work we're doing here. And I know sometimes in America, we get, um, I guess, overbound by legal rules, right? Um, but people should be encouraged to know that if you reach out to your building department in some regions of the country, there's more flexibility than you might realize. And it might be time for some experimentation. So I wanna thank you so much for your time. I wanna thank everyone for uh, joining us today for the U.S. Hemp Building 2022 Hemp Build event. And as you know, we're all volunteers. We wanna invite you to uh, reach out to your friends, join the USHBA, find how to get involved. In our region, we're gonna be working on liberating hemp. We're trying to figure out how to produce some of the legislation so we can grow it fast and grow more of it. We're also looking into workforce development. So in each of your communities, one of the key words is workforce development. And what that might mean is you reach out to others to figure out, well, what kind of programs can you put together? Now, at the same time, just so you know, we also recognize there's probably some value in creating share models. Because when you hear from a person like Jennifer, who spent so much time developing these techniques, it's more than a notion to just hear it and receive it for the cost of this particular kind of meeting. We need to figure out how to make sure we support each other properly. So. With that, I want to thank you for your contributions today. Uh, Saba had indicated the, the value is amazing. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. The value of these sessions are amazing. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. See y'all.